All right, welcome to Awake with Javon. My name is Javon Pera, and today we have the amazing privilege of being with a couple of my favorite people in the entire world. <laughs> so this is Denise Darlene Palsevic and her beautiful husband, <laughs> Joseph Palsevic. And uh, of course, Denise is beautiful. Uh, so. He's way more beautiful, so that worked. That worked perfectly. He is. He is beautiful. You know, the the male in in most species are the ones that are more beautiful because they're trying to attract the beautiful female. These guys, you're like even in your in your beautifulness. So this is uh, awake, as in we're discovering guides that point the way. And what is it pointing the way to? Awakening. And what are we awakening to? Well, this is the conversation for today. Mm -hmm. What are we awakening to? So uh, Denise and Joe have been on an amazing journey of finding love, of uh, discovering the, the lover of their dreams and discovering the intimate lover that they've always had mm -hmm. and have always known, but maybe not always remembered. Mm -hmm. True. Ooh, that's good, huh? That's good. And, uh, and they have this beautiful ministry of not only um, helping people go from conflict and chaos into a beautiful, nourishing, wholesome relationship uh, with another person, but also that same process with, with, uh, with divinity. And also working with these kids on the streets that, that have turned themselves, turned, uh, have called themselves dirty kids, and this wonderful, beautiful, ministry and, and Joe using his his artistic expression in photography, which you guys have got to see. Uh, anyway, I'm getting too far into this. Nudeparadigmoflove.com, right? Mm -hmm. Did you just say nude? nude? I did not say nude paragraph. Mom. Nude, nude paragraph. <laughs> that might be in some of Joe's of life. Pictures, <laughs> that might be another option that we can not against, explore. You know, Joseph is a photographer, so there might be some, some nudity. Maybe. I don't know. Anyway, newparadigmoflove.com yes. is where we can find you. So tell me, the context of this conversation that I'm hoping to, to go into is, is awakening. Mm -hmm. What is it to be awake, first of all? What, what, is, what is that to you? And, and then I'd like to know after that, what, how'd you get here? Yes, very good. All right. Well, that's a great question because this is a buzzword, right? This is. is kind of going around in um, a lot of circles now. So for me to be awake is to be able to be aware of the distinction between the ego's behaviors and, and thought process and my essence mm -hmm. and to be able to be a witness to everything that's happening both uh, within myself within relationship with other people, within relationship to my circumstances, and then to be able to make a choice. And I can choose either to go with the ego and kind of get messy, or I can choose to go on the path of essence and experience that which I prefer, which is usually, you know, a state of peace and joy and freedom. So, so <laughs> awareness, aware, a conscious choice yeah. is awareness. Yeah. And we can't change what we're not aware of. And for the majority of my life, I spent the opposite of being aware, aware or awake yeah, with awake. Javon yes. is being asleep, um, being unconscious to the mechanics, uh, to the programming uh, that the ego is. And when you're unconscious to that, you don't have a choice. Kind of like, you know, the Matrix movie, man, was that brilliant is is that brilliant yeah a synopsis of uh the world of the unseen yeah yeah <laughs> not even knowing that you're programmed yes and that you're just running from a program rather than running from conscious choice yeah that's great so being awake is being aware of your choices as opposed to unconsciously being controlled by all this stuff in life, mm -hmm. being asleep, mm -hmm. just kind of going through. Mm -hmm. So does that mean, so e essence versus ego, right? These two basic choices that we can be awake to. Mm -hmm. Does that mean we can be awake and engaging as ego and be awake engaging as essence? We can. 
we can yes. choose any, to, to any less awake pattern. no i don't think it's any less awake i think it's just an opportunity to choose i can give you an example yes so i remember uh shortly after joe and i got together and we were traveling in the rv and a lot of the stimuli that had caused me to suffer up until that point was now gone mm -hmm. uh except this one area which was in the area of uh, uh, relationship with my kids and the stimuli or the opportunity um, to continue to suffer as a result of the way that they were choosing to engage or not engage with me because they were uh, mad at me and going through some struggles of their own. And I had a choice. And I remember the moment when I felt or heard uh, spirit say to me, um, do you want to continue to suffer? And I paused for a moment to really consider that because everybody's knee jerk reaction is going to be no i don't want to suffer yeah but i really looked at it and i looked at the value of the suffering for me mm -hmm. and i said yeah i do and so i continued to suffer in that experience what, what was the value of suffering um for me uh there is this attachment to if i'm in a state of joy and happiness all the time, then I don't fit into the human mold. Mm -hmm. Then I'm not relatable. Then I'm dismissed actually. Mm -hmm. uh, and I had been given that message many times. Yeah. So like, Oh, you wouldn't understand. Me. Right. You're so perfect. Your life is so perfect. You're happy all the time. Like you don't even get it. You're, you're in denial. You've got rose colored glasses. Like you're Pollyanna. And I heard that message, and what I heard in that message was, uh, you don't belong mm -hmm. with us. So in order to belong, you got to suffer some, uh, right? At least some. Yeah. And then you got to talk about that suffering. Mm -hmm. And it also is a part of my ego identity of we, um, there's, there was still a victim. There was still a little bit of a victim in me, and I had to feed that victim mm -hmm. some suffering. They are doing this to me. They, how unfair, unkind, you know, after all I've done mm -hmm. and here they can't see the good that I've done and the loving mother that I am or whatever the bullshit was <laughs> that was running, that was running the program. But I did, I did get to see, oh, there is some value in here still, because if I completely let go of the victim, of the story of the victim. And I, I stand in full responsibility of how my life looks, including the amount of suffering I was choosing and the, or not choosing. If I stood in that place and I might not get any affection or attention mm -hmm. or because if I went crying to Joe, like, Oh, it's so unfair. And look at how, you know, he would hold me and mm -hmm. he would comfort me. And there was something being fed in that mm -hmm. experience. Wow. So, so I understand the, the spirit gave you the choice. Yes. Do you want that little the, awareness? Of, do you want no more suffering? Yeah. And you decided I'll, I'll stay here. Yeah. Uh, now, and I didn't stay for long, which doesn't so matter. Are you there right now? No. So I got, I was, what given, was the shift? I was given the choice again. Okay. Um, <laughs> many months later, months of suffering. Well, no, um, for the for the greater good. Uh, what I <laughs> what I remember was these two very specific events, and I don't remember the time frame. Uh -huh. um, typically, my suffering would only come um, around about once a month, and I would only stay in it about a day, and then you know go to sleep and get bathed, <laughs> and then wake up the next morning and be like, uh -huh. oh, "Okay, I'm good. I'm back. I'm you know, it's okay. I can let that go now, and I can." I can understand their their place and mm -hmm. their position and why they feel the way they do and they're treating me the way. They, and so the victim was gone. But I remember the second time very clearly that there was just this pause and I heard spirit say, can you find a reason to continue to suffer? Mm. Is there like a good reason yeah. to continue to suffer? And I, Went, okay, wait a minute. Let me look yeah. in honesty. Do you have a peaceful reason to suffer? And I said, no. Yeah. There's no more reason for me to continue to suffer. 
Uh And so I remember just letting that go in that instant. It was completely gone. Mm. And I've had, it's not like I haven't been visited with the opportunity to suffer again. I just am very clear that I don't, I I have no reason anymore to choose it. So I I let it go. So what's the difference between uh, pain and suffering or discomfort and suffering because it seems like it's human to have these pains and discomfort and it also seems like it's human to to suffer right because you know everybody's the end of this road at least for this third dimensional vehicle is pretty dismal for everyone (laughs) i think the odds are like one out of one well if you consider dying dismal just depends on your perspective well if you are your body well if you are if you are your body that's that's Dismal for that, right? Yeah. So, what's the difference between uh, what's the difference between pain and suffering? Is there a difference? Do you have a thought on that? Well, pain. I, I, in my mind, I, I relate it to pain being in the physical body, and suffering being a more mental uh, choice that we've attached to. Is how I how I differentiate those two. So, pain being something I hurt my leg on a fire hydrant. That would be pain. Suffering is. Um, oh, I'm so stupid that I walked right into that fire mm-hmm. hydrant and I wasn't paying attention and where else am I so dumb and where else do I miss the point? And then there's, I perceive suffering as a mental. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of mental activity in it. There's always a story with it where for me, like even um, just, it, just sadness or um, disappointment. If you experience it in the emotion, just the pure raw emotion. It's a very different experience than with the story attached to it. Mm-hmm. When there's a story attached to it, man, you can expand that suffering. You can it can become overwhelming, and oh my god, it's too much, and it can move all the way into depression. Where if you're having an emotional reaction to an experience that is disappointing or painful in some way, and you just allow the emotion to be there with no story, it passes right through you. Mm -hmm. It doesn't linger. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is is there any kind of, uh, because I'm I'm just curious about this suffering thing, because spirituality and suffering, they seem seem historically to to have a lot of ties. Do, Do we need to suffer to be spiritual, to find God, to transcend, to awaken? Yeah, I think so. I think it is the suffering that brings us to the light. It it seems to be pretty universal. Mm -hmm. I don't really know of anyone that just had a beautiful, blissful experience all (laughs) from birth and then just decided that they also wanted to have this deep spiritual experience. Maybe... Paramahansa Yogananda, maybe that guy. Yeah. (laughs) But suffering is the catalyst, it appears. It was in my life. Yeah. For sure. So the very thing you got to lay down was the very thing that brought you to the very ability to lay down that very thing. (laughs) It's almost like when you get your fill of it. Uh And because we all have different... um, uh, pain tolerances. Yeah. Some people, wow, like their pain tolerance scares the hell out of me. Like, wow, you yeah. can tolerate a lot of pain and you're still not looking for light or awakening and you just want to keep going with the, you know, all of the suffering. And then there's other people who have a very low tolerance to suffering. They suffered maybe a year. Um, I give up. <laughs> right. I'll, Wait, I'll let me out. Story in. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, Joseph, what what's what is it to awaken? What's your perspective? My perspective on awakening is you get to the end of uh, thinking that you can be satisfied in the material world, and that, and that question comes up inevitably. There has to be more to this experience. There has to be more meaning, and that was that was the shift for me into into my awakening was finding out what that more is after exhausting the experiences of the material world with yeah. success and career and family and friends and material things and why am i still not happy what is still here that is missing Mm. 
And that then brought me on my journey, which has, you know, been a, it's been a long one. I, I, my midlife crisis happened around 40 where I asked, and it wasn't a crisis. It was, you know, it was a questioning. It was a midlife questioning. And, uh, and it, be, it became a crisis uh, after several years of looking deeper into what is this meaning that I'm seeking and uh, letting go of some of my other responsibilities, which caused a hardship for my wife and, you know, caused then was the catalyst for under, under excavating some other stuff that I hadn't, hadn't wanted to look at. Mm-hmm that shifted into the the stage of awakening. My awakening was, it was a slow process. Denise and I like to talk about the drip system and, you know, <laughs> whether, whether 13 years is a slow process or not in, in the context of time really is right. so debatable. You know, is that a long time? Do people take lifetimes to do this? I suspect I have, used lifetimes towards this awakening. There seems to be a global energy right now that is supporting a great shift in awakening. Mm. And many of us are uh, seeing through the veil of the illusions that you know we've held as true. So that awakening is really, it's a waking up of, oh, this system that I have been thought was my life uh, is a program mm-hmm. that will keep running like this unless I intervene unless spirit intervenes unless there's an energy of shifting and changing so maybe a good a good clue on when it's time to awaken at least to become awake to what you're doing is when it stops to satisfy yes as this you know like the desires stop satisfying right you were going after what you wanted and yes it stopped feeling good it stopped being pleasurable yes, yes. and then you could just be aware of that yeah so for me, that happened in my uh, in my fundamental Christian walk. Mm-hmm. You know, I had spent um, thirty five years uh, in formal Bible studies and um, being very involved in my church. And I remember coming home from church one day and sitting in my prayer chair, looking out the window up at God, and saying, "Out there, I'm not buying it yeah. anymore." You've got to be kidding. There has got to be more to God than what I, like I kept bumping up my head up against the ceiling of Christianity. Like, this is it? Wait, no, this can't be it. This isn't just all there is. This is, if we can figure this out, then we're on the wrong path. Like, <laughs> you, you're beyond figuring out. And then I invited more. I said, God, if there's more, then take me there. Like, by the hand. Mm. Did it work? It did. <laughs> it did. There was so, fear involved, but so, it worked. <laughs> since then, you guys, uh, relationship changes, life, ex- life, life experience changes, the way you live your life changes, where you live your life changes. Yeah. You have a, a best-selling book, yeah. relationship book, New Paradigm of Love. No. <laughs> that's dot com. That's our book. That's uh, our real passion site. revolution. Sorry. That's right. Real passion revolution. So real passion revolution, uh, which I'm so thankful had been in the in the process of that. One of the original readers. Yes. Yeah. And uh, and wow, what a powerful, amazing uh, book about taking responsibility for yourself as a as a lover. Yes. And that it's never it's never uh, my responsibility to change. My lover, I mean, that was one of the biggest things that you, you say often is in your book. Yeah. Um, how, did you, how did it get to a place where you were dissatisfied with where you were at to writing a book, Real Passion Revolution, mm-hmm. and having it be a great seller? Not only that, being able to work with couples and see their relationships and their life transformed spirit moved through you. I mean, how did that happen? That's it. <laughs> oh, That's that, a big difference. Oh, that. Okay. that was a huge, huge difference. So yeah, the setup was the suffering in um, the relationship that I was in. Um, beautiful man just wounded and he was my teacher. He, the suffering that I experienced in the relationship was the waking me up to what was going on. 
and um, caused me to go do some deep spiritual work so that I could, I thought it was so that I could stay in the relationship, but it was really so that I could heal enough to leave the relationship only because he wasn't on a healing path. Mm -hmm. So then I had all these tools and I had a lot of people say to me, Denise, you need to write a book. You need to write a book. You need to write a book. And I'm like, ah, I flunked out of English class in high school. Like I'm going to write a book. I don't know. Um, I, so I, I, Joe became my experiment. Lucky you. So not only did I have, I had a, I had a lot of tools, like, you know, pieces of a puzzle that I had collected these pieces over uh -huh. all these years. I was married for 33 years. Tim was my high school sweetheart. We were together since we were 16. Mm -hmm. So all the events that took place and all of, all of my continued um, hunger for learning and knowing and growing and being in relationship with God, I just gathered all these pieces and they all magically came together in this really beautiful way that became an experiment for me uh -huh. to see how's this work yeah. in real life, you know? If I, if I did the relationship differently, yeah. could it turn yeah. out differently? Yeah, if I apply <laughs> these tools that are, by the way, very radically contradictory yeah. to the way that 99% of the population does relationships, yeah. is this, am I crazy or yeah. is this gonna work? Give us some examples of, of your experiments. That became your secret secret recipe too, right? Yes, it became part of the. But you got to get the book. <laughs> Ten to find secret out all ingredients That's for right. healed, healthy, healthy relationships. Uh, yeah. So um, the very first thing I told Joe early in our relationship was, "You will never be my problem. You will only be my opportunity to address that which requires my attention within me." How long ago was this? This was seven, seven years. Seven, seven years ago. Seven years ago. Okay. Yeah. Has, has have you ever been her problem? No. No, in fact, I, I uh, some of my actions trigger a response in Denise that she then takes back and, and processes through yeah. and doesn't harm me or doesn't shame me and doesn't judge me or say an unkind word to me. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's easy, right? To, I mean, I know uh, it, being married and having people in my life, it's easy for them to be my problem. Yeah. You should not have said that. Yeah. You should not have done that. Right. You know? Because that made me feel this. Right. Instead of, huh, that's an interesting stimuli that's true. that just triggered something that's in me. Yeah. It's in me. So if I don't want to be triggered in that way, then I should probably go see what's in me mm -hmm. and deal with that. I remember um, when I, uh, I was an associate pastor for a church for a little while and I was in charge of counseling and these couples would come to me and they would sit on a bench much like this and say he, when he does this it makes me feel this and she when she does this it makes me feel this and um she's just always tripping my triggers and then I would look at him and say well then I guess we should deal with your triggers she, <laughs> what he wanted was Wait for me to deal oh, with no. her. Fix that girl yeah, right fix there. her. Make her behave differently. So we're, That's powerful. Yeah. What we're trying to do in these relationships, most people, is they're trying to get a need met oh, yeah. that they perceive as outside of them. So therefore, if you behave in certain ways, you're, um, you're part of the problem. I'm trying to get addressed. And if you'll change the way that you behave, then things will be better for me. Mm -hmm. And this is not true. First mm -hmm. of all, the list is endless. Mm -hmm. It just moves from this thing to this thing to this thing. Yeah. It never stops because mm -hmm. the perception is the problem is outside of me. Mm -hmm. It's like it's like desire. The fulfillment of desire creates desire. Yeah. I want, to, I want, to, I want. I want you to change. I want this, the new mm -hmm. thing. Well, that that concept is is incredible to me because just that alone knowing that no one and nothing is my problem, that's enough to awaken. Because that makes everything and everyone that comes into my life uh, an, an opportunity to reveal. That's right. And so who would, be, who would be more helpful for me than the person who can 
bring about more revealing situations. That's right. <laughs> the biggest asshole in your life is your biggest, the greatest asset. That's right. So and there's, <laughs> and there's no hiding, right? My wife, Carolyn, knows like all of my games. Yeah. And so because of that, she's been my greatest, my greatest teacher and, and my toddlers who yeah. are actually pretty good teachers. They're great teachers. So the people that are, and not to say, I mean, Carolyn takes easy on me for sure. I'm, I'm fortunate in that. But we all have, we all have teachers. And if that's the case, then the relationships that are the hardest, like you said, the biggest assholes, then those are the, the most valuable for that's our right. growth. Yeah. And, They're and the awakening. greatest gift. You actually called them. You actually... I called them. How so? You invited them into your, into your field. I didn't call. You, you are sub, your subconscious essence uh -huh. that wants to awaken said, well, maybe this, let's bring in this guy, this one that just triggers everything that just makes you feel like you're going to lose your mind. Mm -hmm. And what part of what happens in relationships is people think, well, because you trigger me, that means we're not a good fit. Right. And well, I'm going to move on wrong. Yeah. Good luck with that. Cause everybody that you move on to you're, you're attracting what you require to awaken. Cause I bring along my triggers. That's right. And so you're actually asking for these people to come into your life so that you'll wake up. Your soul's greatest cry is to awaken. Mm -hmm. Indeed. So let, let's, let's, you work with people, you coach with people. You, you've done immersive coaching, which is pretty amazing, where you've let people live with you yeah. for extended periods of time for yeah. the sake of awakening. Yes. No hiding from coaching there. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> so how do how do we do that? Because it's an, the stimulus from the assholes, so to speak, or the people that hurt us mm -hmm. over and over again. It's enough to just shut down it and is. protect immediately or attack. It is. How do how does someone use that as as a gift? Well, it's all perspective. Javon, so if you think that you're um, the that the the, div, that the design of the relationship is so that you will make me happy, that is going to fail at every point. But if you come into the relationship or even awaken to the relationship that you are the gift for me to grow and to heal. Mm -hmm. That's the divine purpose. And so then I can see all of your actions that are organic for you. Mm -hmm that drive me nuts are not against me. They are for me. So the first thing that has to shift is that perspective. And then, um, and you won't do this. They, people don't do this well out the gate. So, right. So we get these, we get these concepts and they sound really good yeah. and we're going to go for it. And then we just trip over ourselves constantly and find ourselves reacting and yelling and, you know, trying to get them to change. And, but there, so Joe and I teach that, um, that awakening is 85% of all the work. So it's becoming conscious to the triggers. And anytime you move from a state of peace or yeah. happiness or contentment to any negative emotion, you've been triggered. That's your opportunity to go and do this inner work yeah. and discover what's there. And then, of course, because I would tell Joe, you're not my problem, I would even say, ooh, I just got triggered. I'm going to go see what this is about. Yeah. And I'd walk away from him. Step away. Step away from the trigger or from the stimuli. Just remove yourself. Go do this work. And then I would come back to him and say, here's what I learned. Wow. Here's what I learned. And by the way, don't change that behavior. Like I'm not asking him ever to change the way you do that. He will often, he would be um, stimulated himself to say, oh, honey, I'm sorry. You know, I'll try not to do that. And I'm like, no, 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 no. That is not the point here. Mm -hmm. Because I require those triggers in order to wake up to this place in my life right. that needs healing. So Joe is late for something or Joe does something that he said he wouldn't do or doesn't do something that you said he said he would do or any number of things. Yeah. And then at that point you get to say, you get to not say, Hey, you were supposed to do that and try to change the behavior. Yeah. You get a chance to say, okay, this is so fascinating. 
or interesting yeah. or, or whatever it is. And you can say, what, yeah. what is in me yeah. that is being revealed? Why yeah. does this hurt me so? Yeah. And by the way, it hurts. I mean, it's a trigger. It doesn't feel good. I'm not in, on the inside all zen uh, going, oh, I think I have a trigger here. I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah. Let me go see what this is about. Let me yeah. see what this is about. Wow. So what's, what's Speak that? Speak to any of that. What is that experience like for you, Joseph? How, well, how, it's filled I with mean, grace. you notice this is happening with her? Or does it seem like nothing's happening? And you just get whatever you want. I notice, I notice more now. We should all be in relationship with me. So <laughs> You'll never be in trouble. I know. Sorry. <laughs> I, I do notice more now. I didn't notice, I, did, I wasn't paying attention at the beginning of our relationship. I just thought, well, that's a promise that, wow, that seems amazing. Yes, I'm going to ride that out for as long as I can. Yeah. And, uh, and then, you know, processing through, I, as I began to awaken more, again, on the drip system, as I began to awaken, I began to see, oh, wow, some of the things that I'm, the truths that she invited me to share could, could probably be very difficult for her to be taking in. We'd been in relationship for four or five years up until this point, and I was in a story of this isn't going to last forever. I'm going to continue on to other relationships. I never did. Uh, but Denise would check in with me. Are you still planning on on going into other relationships? And I would say yes. And then so noticing how how that's a part open of the story. she yeah how openly she would then take that in, and she wouldn't shame me like you're such an asshole. I'm so good to you. Do you not recognize all the stuff? She'd never ever shamed me. So she would take that. She would pro go go away from me. Process. I didn't even know what was happening. Come back. Say okay, I got triggered. Um, can we talk about this? And then so she really modeled and she showed me how to have these conversations. Um, and because I was never in trouble, I was soft enough. It was a soft enough setting for me to go, oh, okay, I feel safe here. My little inner wounded Joey feels safe here to discuss this and to talk about it. And then, so that's how the awakening happened for me. It was a slow, gentle, full of grace process uh, that occasionally required me to look at some shadows and to be in some suffering, but it wasn't very frequently for me, but that's why Denise is so much more involved than I am because she's, she, to the extent that we suffer and process through these things is then to the extent that we are healed. So I, I know that there's more healing in me that is required. So it's a beautiful thing because you had both come from, uh, relationships and situations that were painful and that didn't work on some levels. Uh, and you were both, when you met, uh, freed in a, in a sense of whatever that was. Mm -hmm. And Joe, Joe, you were like, okay, well, I'm going to experience the world. I don't want one relationship. And Denise, you, you had decided at some point, like, hey, this is my opportunity uh, for growth, this is this seems like my op this is this is addressing my greatest fear. That's right. Uh, because he said that he wasn't going to be with you that's forever. That's right. But that's what you wanted. That's right. So how, could, it seems like there is the fractal of awakening just in that. Mm -hmm. You know, the the one part that replicates, and you can see the whole, but it's it's actually all encompassed in the one little action of giving your heart completely in something right. that you can't keep. That's right. How did that? How did that work? And then in the end, because you guys are married now. That's right. <laughs> so <laughs> something worked. <laughs> married right. when you said you weren't going to get married, you were yeah. probably going to move on. Well, I wouldn't even say something there worked. The fact is that seven years, seven years into this relationship, it keeps getting better. That's evidence that it worked. I'm not a huge proponent of saying, oh, just because we're married now, something worked. Because as a wedding photographer for two decades, I saw lots of people look very happy on their wedding day and then end up very miserable within a couple of years. Because of some expectation of life's going to be different. Yes, yes. Well, and, and generally what I've noticed is people perform. They're on their best behavior when they're dating or they're on their best behavior when they're courting yeah. or initially dating. And then marriage happens and then they get exhausted or they go, well, okay, I have you now. Now you, you got the ring on my your finger. Now you're hooked and now I can show up however I want to. 
and that generally looks like the wife nagging and the you know husband being disappointed and always being a disappointment mm -hmm. shut and, down. and so mm -hmm. things then shut down so the way that i'm measuring success is not necessarily marriage because while i was committed to denise every day in my mind it made sense that because i was because i had free will and and denise knew my agenda to date other women at some point um, that was the agreement that we had and she said I'm enjoying this relationship and I'd like to stay in it with you as long as as you'd like and if when when you want to have another experience then just let me know and and you're free to go so I was mm -hmm. able to show up authentic and he said please show up authentic in this relationship you know if you burp and fart do that don't modify don't modify who you are I want to know who it is that I'm choosing and every day I was choosing Denise regardless of the story that I had in my mind that at some point there would be another relationship I was choosing her every day and once I became more awake to that fact and then noticed the story wasn't even true it's not what I wanted what I wanted was right here what I still want is right here which then a lot every day makes it easy for me to choose this and to be in relationship in the joy of the relationship with Denise mm -hmm. because I'm never, I'm never harmed. Occasionally, Joey, my ego shows up and says some harmful things uh, that trigger Denise, and then she processes them and comes back, and she's like, "Okay, good. I'm no longer, no longer triggered by those things." So, the commitment that Denise has made in this relationship, standing for my healing and my growth, she told me many, many times, "I'm not going to hurt you," and in my mind, I read that as of course you're not going to hurt me. I'm not going to let you. I'm going to keep my heart partially closed to you. But because of the safety that she continued to offer, no matter how much I pushed, no matter how much I tested her, she's like, I'm, she never lashed out. I was never in trouble. She never lost her, her um, she never lost her cool with me. Like, where else would I go? Where else would I be in relationship? How is this relationship even possible? Um, so Denise wrote a book because I failed to write a book. She, that was the catalyst for her writing the book. She's like, well, Joe, you should be working on your book. Oh, I, Joe's no, not my problem. I didn't know wait, 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 because I didn't actually <laughs> say that. No, I know. You would just notice me not working on my book and then go, hmm, okay, well, and then, oh, relate it to myself. Oh, I'm not working on my book. That's my responsibility. So Denise cranked out a book, made it a bestseller, helped a bunch of people while I'm still in the process of dinkering around with my photo <laughs> book. It doesn't even require any words. <laughs> it's going to be a great book. Though. Oh, it's so good. So that's one of the, one of the concepts in the book is that um, our relationships are just mirrors for each other and all the judgments that we have and all the shoulds he should, he shouldn't do X, Y, and Z um, are just an opportunity for me to look in the mirror and say, where is that showing up in my life? Uh -huh. So when we would be traveling and I, um, I saw this amazing potential for him to write this book right. and I would with just, all of his photography, with his yeah, photography yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and his words, he's a wordsmith, so yeah. beautiful. And I just saw this. And so rather than say to him, like would be more typical, like, Hey, what's going on with you? Like, why aren't you writing your yeah. book? Like, why, why are you wasting your time on the internet, on Facebook, when you could actually be writing a, an amazing bestseller? I would just notice, and I would notice my judgment of he should be working on his book, and I would go grab my computer, and I would sit on the couch, and I would start typing, because that was my cue. Yeah. He became my cue. What, for me being in a relationship with somebody who clearly did not consciously did not want to be in a long-term relationship or, or uh, he wasn't smitten by me, obviously, or he, you know, it's not like would have put a ring on it faster. Right. But what I recognized was like, he was so perfect for my triggers. Yeah. I'm like, this is exactly what I need. And this is the area that I need to heal. And after about four and a half years, five years, we, we got married um, November 11th, 2018. And it was about six months before that, maybe eight months before that. I had checked in with him. I'm just checking with you because he's super happy, right? He was just happy and seemed to be really enjoying, very seemed very in love with me. Yeah. So I just checked in, like, where are you on this idea of, of 
is this relationship going to last? And he's like, no. And I, there, and there was no trigger. Uh -huh. And I said, I just want to thank you for being such an amazing teacher for me because what I've learned as a result of being in this relationship with you is I am an amazing woman. I'm an amazing partner and any man would be lucky to have me as a partner. Thank you. That's what needed to heal in me yes. because I thought I just needed other people, other men or a man and, and they didn't necessarily like I wasn't bringing that much to the table. I had no idea, Javon, who I was mm. in relationship. And I got to discover who I am in relationship as a result of this one. And especially it being so unstable. <laughs> and do you remember You're that welcome. conversation? Oh, of course. Yeah, absolutely. Of course how, I how was that for you when she said that? It she, got ter totally turned me on because her confidence level just completely rose. I'm like, yes, of course you're not a doormat to be walked on. Yes, stand up, my queen. So she really rose. Uh, her stock was rising. Mm -hmm. Put it that way, uh, and it still is. I mean, the the applications of this work have truly blessed me so much. Yeah, Javon, it's That's it's fun. been my it, it has been through this relationship that my awakenings happen. Yeah, and I, I'm just going to add on a personal note your your love for each other is such a wonderful overflowing love mm -hmm. to everyone to me to my kids to your clients mm -hmm. i know so thank you for that all started yeah. here poured oh. out just poured out poured out Giovanna, really the way this love works it it i became so full um we teach a concept of you can hear over and over and over again how great you are or how lovable you are or how successful you are by thousands or millions of people and still not be able to believe it denise introduced to me the concept of that my bucket didn't have a bottom in it so i could hear i'm loved over and over and over again but i couldn't it, it never would fill me up because there was a hole in the bottom of the bucket and she helps me repair the bucket so that then you repair a hole in your bucket. Well, you have to reprogram the lie that I believe that I'm unlovable with the truth and mm -hmm. then collect it. So if I'm unlovable, it just passes through. You can't, there's nowhere to hold it. Yeah. You have to heal that. And if you notice that people tell you how awesome you are, beautiful you are, loving you are, and it, there's this kind of, it doesn't feel like it's congruent. Then that is telling you there's a hole there that there is a wound that requires a repair. What, what typically happens in relationships is that when someone notices that their partner is being maybe selfish, they think that if I tell you you're being selfish and I point out to you all the ways that you're being selfish, that you'll go, oh, I don't want to be selfish, so, <laughs> so I'll be something, you know, I'll do, I'll do these things for you so that I'm not perceived as selfish. But what it does is it, re, um, it, it reiterates what they already believe about themselves. Yeah. And so if you don't want your partner to do, engage in selfish behaviors, point out every time they're generous. Mm -hmm. Every time they're thoughtful, every time they're compassionate, yeah. and and just only talk about that. Water, you, water where you want to grow. That's right. So just ignore the things that you don't want to see, and and bring into the light and yeah. magnify the things that you want to see mm -hmm. in that person because that's actually there. Even if you can't see very much manifestation of it, yeah. everything that's beautiful that you want to experience in your partner and or that you believe that they are, but they're not showing is there. So mm -hmm. call it Speak forward. Yeah. Speak it out. And that's what Denise would do. She'd be like, Oh Joe, there you go. Being so selfish again, giving your time to your nieces and nephews. <laughs> there you go. Being so selfish again, you know, spending time with your daughter, whatever the story was, she just would, you know, she'd use her charming sarcasm and uh, help me further along that way. Because, you know, the ego is very tricky in its ways of mass. So she was saying that you weren't being selfish? I was being sarcastic. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. sure. He'd get off, you know, the phone with his daughter having spent an hour and a half with her process, letting her process her life. And I'd say, ah, oh, there you are again, being selfish. Because that's what your story was. He, yeah. Well, I was, he, I was told, I was, you yeah, know. No, it was his story. Because he came into this selfish. relationship and said, I just want to let you know that I'm selfish. And I said, all right, well, thank you for letting me know. And I'll, I'll let you know when I see it. Uh, 
And I just kept pointing out how he was generous Ooh. and thoughtful and sensitive and kind and compassionate and caring and loving. He's just very giving, not, so, not selfish. That's you the seem like system a great, of love. Both of you. I, I want to be in a relationship with both of you now. <laughs> you, you are. are. Oh, <laughs> thank God. We're waking up together, brother. Yes, we are. Yeah. I like asleep with Javon. I think that's a. I think that's a, that's another podcast for you. Asleep with Javon. Have have the interview in bed with you, like you're waking up in the morning. And you're like, well, what did you dream about tonight? All right, we'll get we'll get that one going next. I'll have you back on the show. Yeah, and then he'll have the uh, um, nude paradigm. Of, uh, the nude, yeah, nude paradigm, paradigm of love. Yes. That probably is the website. <laughs> it seems like it would be. Now people. Uh, in spiritual circles, I would, there's a lot of people that, that want to just transcend the human experience and human thing that we're in. And I would, I've seen it to have like this interaction, this human interaction is less spiritual than this God interaction. But what I'm seeing is this this agreement or this engagement that I have that you're saying with the, bit, the most difficult relationship, this awareness that I'm getting about what is going on in me that I can address or be aware of, right? These triggers, these wounds, these beliefs mm -hmm. that are keeping my bucket open that I can never fill up no matter what I'm searching for. Being aware of that, it doesn't just help my relationship, but it helps, it helps my identity it helps that's my right. connection with with divinity itself that's right is is it all i mean is that all we would have to do is just one of your secret ingredients to to awaken mm. could it be enough uh i don't know because i call it a recipe yeah um can you make a cake with just flour I don't know. I mean, if that's just one of the secret recipes, it seems like we should all get the book it's immediately. Pretty, it's a pretty powerful, that's a pretty powerful concept right there. There are some, I think that there are human conditions that need to be, um, we need to do an override of or a reprogramming of. And so that's what the different concepts are about. Um, so just doing that one, you know, what's, what's interesting about this, this healing process is we can't escape the wounds. Yeah, you know, if you're born, you're wounded. Like you're, there's just no getting around it. Uh, we try to escape the wounds either by projecting outside of us and making other people our problem, or we try to escape it through a myriad of um, self-medicating. There are so many ways to self-medicate and try to put ourselves to sleep. But what I love about God is that He is far less interested in our comfort. He is committed to our growth and our awakening. And so this is why we attract what we require. So if you just do a survey of your experience of the relationships that you're in and the circumstances that you're in, those things are perfectly designed for your awakening and you asked for them. Your soul asked for them. So what we have is the thing that we require. Yes. We don't need to travel to the Himalayas. No. We don't need to have a, a month silence retreat. No. We could. You can. But, but what we have is actually what we require. It's enough. And, and especially the stuff I'm trying to get away from. Yeah. Well, so there's a, there's a Zen monk story, I believe, um, and I'm going to really screw it up. Right. But the essence of it is this monk, you know, ended up spending six months in solitude. Uh -huh. And his, whoever his, he answered to said, it's time for you to, reintegrate and come into the town, the city or whatever it mm. was. And he said, how are you feeling? And he said, I'm just in a state of bliss, constant bliss all the time. I have transcended the ego. And the first thing he does when he gets into town is he goes into a grocery store and he's waiting in a checkout line. And the poor little clerk behind the, the counter is having difficulty ringing things up on, for the person ahead of him. So that by the time the Zen monk gets to the register, he is furious. He's livid. So he gets confronted just by walking into a grocery store with everything that he didn't process because he didn't have any stimuli right. when he was in solitude. 
So yeah, you can run away, but if you're gonna have any kind of relationship at all, unless you just wanna live on an island somewhere all by yourself, you're not gonna grow. Yeah. The, dis the, the divine design mm -hmm. of the universe is that we are in relationship, and those relationships are designed to be of conflict so that we can wake up. So yeah, that's, that's the spiritual process, is, is doing this work in relationship. I mean, it's, it's the one thing, because as we're processing, as, you're, as my partner is not my problem, my partner is not my problem, I'm having to go inside mm -hmm. and reprogram the log in my own eye before we try to be helpful and spiritual and take the splinter out of our, out of our partner's eye. Yeah. So. Our, our coworkers are not our problem. Our children are not our problem. Our neighbor is not our problem. Our circumstances, our bank account, none of it. None of it out there is any problem that is disturbing our peace, mm -hmm. that is robbing us of the life of the kingdom of heaven within. Mm. It's us. <laughs> mm. It's wonderful. And what's awesome is that puts you in power. Mm -hmm. This is personal power right here. If we think our problems are all out there, we're powerless. Mm -hmm. But recognizing that all everything is here, that puts me in control of all of it because I get to go and do this work and heal these things. These mm -hmm. false, these are, this is the false identity that we're confronting mm -hmm. because the true identity needs nothing from others. It's completely whole and complete. It doesn't, it doesn't need anything in return. Mm. So it's amazing. The other thing about, about this that I think is really powerful that I got to witness is so we do reap what we sow mm -hmm. and a lot of people think that they're they've been sowing love into a relationship but they're getting conflict back mm -hmm. um and it's really good to look at that and, and just ask yourself if i'm not giving love and i'm actually trying to get a need met by my good behaviors or by my loving behaviors but what i'm really doing is i'm looking for a return so I'm serving you, I'm you know, making sure that your needs are met, but I'm over here triggered because you don't say thank you enough or you're not taking out the trash without me asking or mm -hmm. you know, whatever's not happening Coming reciprocally, then, then I got to look at that and go, oh, I'm actually not giving. I'm actually trying to get Trading. something from my partner or my children or my coworker right, or whatever, right. whatever the case may be. Um, where when you really are loving, there's no record of it. There's no, I did all this for you. There's right. no, um, you're not looking for anything back because love is complete. The, the receiving is in the giving. Mm -hmm. So what I got to experience with Joe is um, I already, I don't know how many marriages or relationships have died over the trash being taken out, not being taken out <laughs> or not being taken out at the moment that it's requested to be taken out or the bag, new bag wasn't put in the right. trash can thing. Like it's crazy. Uh, and yet relationships die on that hill. So I knew I was never even going to ask him to take out the trash. I would just take out the trash cause I want it taken out. Uh -huh. So I would go to the trash can and I swear he's like, a puppy that hears a dog, his food being rattled, like, oh, it's time to eat. And he would just perk up and go, I'll take out the trash. He looks for ways to bless me, make me happier. What can I do for her? He's surveying my world. He's listening for how can I make her happy? What makes, you know, what does she delight in? Because love is given and I'm not trying to get anything. Mm. And so I think that, so when that's the experience that you're having, you know that you've been sowing love. When the experience that you're having is resistance, then you know you've been trying to get something from that person. They haven't been necessarily willing to give. Mm. That's beautiful. So there's ways that people can get a hold of you because you do coaching, correct? Yes, we do. Uh, you have the book. They can find you at newparadigmoflove.com. Dot com. Um, is that the best way to get a hold of you? Yeah. So coaching, reading the book, going through your programs, 
enrolling you to, to do the immersive program. Those are all great things. How, what's, what's some ways that you can help people get from where they are now while of may, they, they're not in a relationship that is like you're describing. Uh, they're not in a life that feels like you're describing. Uh, they don't have the awake experience like you're describing. How do they get from there to say here? What's what's some coaching that you would do if you can't talk with them? What's some tips? Well, first of all, I mean, I had a guy in Australia pick up my book and completely transform his life. So the book should the be work. about ten thousand dollars a copy is really more of the the value of it, yeah. or you know, priceless. Uh, if people will do the work, because it is a workbook. Mm -hmm. um, that when you when you get to a place of suffering in your life where you are at around an eight or a ten, you just feel like I can't do this anymore that's the door to your transformation. Mm -hmm. If you just want it to look a little bit better, that's not enough to get you to the other side because the work is intense. It's intense in, in the fact that you have to use a lot of self-control for awakening. You can no longer blame. Mm -hmm. No one else is to blame in your life. Um, uh, for me, the, the key component is my connection with God. It's mm -hmm. this developing a real tangible relationship with all that is intangible. Mm -hmm. We can't, you know, see, feel, touch um, God or all that is God or anything that is in, in that way in the spiritual sense. So it's really having a hunger and a desire and a willingness. Mm -hmm. I believe that our role is to be willing and spirit's role is everything else. So step one, willing. Be willing. And what are we, what, what willing for what? For transformation, for awakening. Let's just say you're so asleep that you don't even know what any of the steps would look like, but you have seen someone maybe that's awake uh -huh. and you want that. Your role, your part, your only part that you play on that chessboard is I'm willing. Yeah, willing for whatever whatever it takes. We don't know what that looks like, right? Yeah, to give up, to let go, to start take on whatever that is. Yeah. Now, one of the things that you guys do, which I think is is brilliant, is you have uh, you created some separation between who you are and and the ego is, mm -hmm. and you've done that by naming your ego. Mm -hmm. And you'll talk about your ego as it's as if it's another person. <laughs> it is because so, it is another. And now, is it, is this a good tactic that people can can take on? And, and how does that work? And why does it help? Well, it's it's incredibly helpful because it helps it helps us to make a distinction between our true self and that program that is posing as us. Uh -huh. uh, the Enneagram was a tool that we found incredibly helpful to begin to identify those predictable patterns. And then by naming those predict predictable patterns, I, I've named mine Joey. And so when Joey shows up, um, there's a very different energy that is present. And it's one of judgment. It's one of um, upset. It's one of control. And I, for a very, very, very recent, well, for a very long time until just recently, um, have still been fooled. Like the ego still shows up. Recently, I discovered spiritual ego. I'm like, oh, great. I thought I, would, I, thought I was in this <laughs> spiritual place and a transcended ego. And I'm like, oh, nope, fooled again. That was all ego too. <laughs> okay. Wow. What is real? So Joey uh, has been expanding in, in my awareness of how prevalent the program that is running me frequently is. And so by separating that from my truth, the true self, um, I'm not shaming and I'm not harming. I'm not producing guilt. Uh, in like, oh, I should have said that. Yeah. I'm so bad. I'm like, oh my gosh, I, I was up. fooled again. Yeah. yeah. That's just the ego. Yeah. Right? Uh, like, oh. Kind of reminds me of... Uh, grumpy old men uh -huh. or the movie or even just a general grumpy old man because if a grumpy old man is grumpy and you expect them to be grumpy 
you could even have a lot of love for that grumpy old man. You're just like, oh, that's yeah. just Edgar, you yeah. know. Right, right, right. <laughs> he means well, right? right. Yeah. And so I, I see you guys when you do that. When you talk about Joey or Deborah, right. mm -hmm. I, I divulge your ego's name. Sorry, name is Deborah. Yeah, <laughs> it's like it's like oh, bless their heart, right? Right, and they're exactly. Just, they're doing their best. They There's, are innocent and wounded. That's right. Yeah. Innocent and wounded. Yeah. Our egos are innocent and wounded. They're just trying to keep do their best to keep us alive. Yeah. But the, you know, the vibration of ego is is um, constricting. It is. Uh, from operating from a place of scarcity, it's operating from a place of fear, and so it gets us into a lot of trouble. And I'll, and I'll say us because you know uh, my essence is part of this body attached to an ego, and mm -hmm. we don't escape it. Mm -hmm. We don't escape it, but we can keep learning from it. We can keep noticing when it comes up, and we can do the work or with of awareness of awakening to hopefully not harm others around us, but and very specifically harm ourselves mm. to, I should be further along. How, how in the world did I think that that was okay to say or to do? I go, oh, that, was, that was ego stepping in and trying to interfere again, just yeah. trying to control out of a place of fear. Mm. So in noticing and loving, loving, I, I hold a perception of that, 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 that ego is sort of like a small child that's been wounded mm. um, and it just and, it, and and take a look take a look at what it's presenting when we can take a look at what is it's presenting then we can see it for the truth of, that it is we can really wrestle with okay is this what is this thing what am i afraid of what am i not looking what am i not seeing and then when we'll be still so the second component i think to your question was what practical steps can people do to begin applying this is to slow down and give themselves permission to be still long enough to be able to see, hmm, okay, something is presenting here that either wants to trigger me or I want to have shame or guilt around, or I feel guilty and this is a result of how, how I'm feeling guilty. We can take a look at it and then we can process through it so that hopefully that it, it doesn't come back as strong the next time you go, oh, I see you again. I'm going to replace this lie of separation or fear or scarcity. I'm going I'm to replace that with the truth. Bring that, bring that uh, little wounded child into the light for healing. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I believe this, that's the beautiful redemption that is happening, not only on a, a level that we're experiencing right now in this lifetime within ourselves, but the grand scheme is all a, a reunification, a rejoining of that which is separate. And the ego is just that component of this third density of experience that we agree to for the veil of unknowing. Mm -hmm. And so then we wake up, you know, wake up. Yeah. Joey, wake up, it's okay, it's okay. <laughs> yeah. Your fears are, are valid here, let's look at them. Yeah. Well, well uh, they're also always based in a lie. So anytime our peace is disturbed, we're believing a lie. Mm -hmm. And it, it always goes back to the lie is always about God, who God is, who we are in relationship to God, who we are, <clears throat> our identity. But, it, but it's always, even with it, when it's our identity, it's still about God. So when you can create that separation and you talk about this in the third person, mm -hmm. knowing that this is not me, mm -hmm. this is not the me, the I, the eternal I that, you know, is not only cannot sin, it's not guilty of a thing. It's pure and holy and the divine essence of God. Um, creating that separation really diffuses the energy. Like it just, and we, and when you can laugh about it, Mm -hmm. When you can joke about your ego, you're in a really, really good place. Mm -hmm. There are many times I'll just say, oh my gosh, you are not going to believe what Deborah is up to today. <laughs> Listen to her train of thought yes. and then I'll just share with them. This is what she was thinking today. Yeah, tell on her. Oh my, yeah. my. Bring it up. Bless her heart. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah there's, there's definitely power and healing and, and having something in, in the light yeah. out, out in the open. Yes. So frequently we're saying I, you know, when we're actually referring to ego. Yes. So making that distinction is really powerful. It's a, mm -hmm. it's a great practice to separate out from that which is true from that which is not. Wow. That's beautiful.
So we can walk in the light and we can be love and we can be love for ourselves. We can be love for one another. That's beautiful. All right. Thank you to you. Yes, you're welcome. This has been lovely. Yes. <laughs> we love spending you, time with you. Uh, Thanks for waking up. Yes, my pleasure. If you want to get a hold of Denise and Joseph, go to newparadigmoflove.com. Get the book, Real Passion Revolution. It's a beautiful workbook. You don't have to pay $10,000. Yeah. yeah, it's only like 20 bucks. It's 20 bucks. Get it on Amazon. You can get it on your website, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Denise Darlene is the author on the book, mm -hmm. even though she's now Denise Paulicivic. Or Paulicivic. <laughs> if you spell it out, it sounds like Paulicivic. It does. It does. <laughs> uh, so get that right away. Thank you guys so much. I love you. Mm -hmm. And I hope... Mm -hmm. uh, Hope we should, we should do this again. We should. We have much more to say. <laughs> <laughs> you have a lot more questions too, I'm sure. I do. I have them written down right here. Awesome. All right. Thanks for having us. Yeah, Thank you're welcome. You. So here's our options now. We can.